This episode is brought to you in part by Viva. Look, if you work at the site level, if you manage regulatory, uh, and you're not using Viva Site Vault, then what are you doing? Look, I know there are more and more options coming to market now for e-regulatory, uh, but what you need is a company that's easy to work with and that you can trust. Uh, and really, no other company fits the bill as much as Viva. Viva is already being used in 65% of all global clinical trials. It's being used by over 400 industry sponsors and more than 4,500 sites. Uh, on top of that, Viva is a public benefit corporation, which means by definition, they have a legal duty to balance the interests of all concerned stakeholders. That means uh, patients, employees, shareholders, society as a whole, and you as a site. Uh, so while there are many companies out there fighting to mindlessly eat up market cap, uh, Viva's out here trying to make things better for all of us. So check out Viva Site Vault. To learn more, uh, visit sites.viva.com today. This episode is also being brought to you in part by Real-Time CTMS, a leading provider of innovative software solutions for clinical trial research sites, site network sponsors, and CROs. Uh, Real-Time systems allow users to manage complex clinical research processes with powerful user-friendly interfaces that are revolutionizing how research gets done. Uh, look, we track all of our site financials through Real-Time, uh, and frankly, it's uh, it's a game changer. Uh, so if you're not using real time, go check it out. Uh, their customer service is also second to none. To get a free demo, check out the company's website at realtime-ctms.com and complete one of their contact forms. Hello and welcome to the Note to File podcast, a collection of interviews, best practices, and candid commentary for clinical research sites. I'm your host, Brad Hightower. Our guest this week is Steve Rosenberg. Uh, Steve's career in life science and healthcare spans more than 40 years. Uh, he's led the development and deployment of cloud-based solutions with a focus on driving more integrated approaches to patient-centric trial management. Steve was most recently Senior Vice President and General Manager of Oracle Health Sciences. Prior to that, he was the visionary behind the Integrated Clinical Trial Technologies suite introduced by Phase Forward, which was acquired by Oracle in 2010. Uh, and recently, Steve joined Umotif's board earlier this year. Uh, in his spare time, Steve enjoys summers on Cape Cod with his family. He also sits on the board of two residential homes for abused children and started a nonprofit company, the One by One Project, with his wife to help people in need in the Boston area. Uh, so, another great conversation this week. Uh, we discuss the current state of EPRO ECOA in clinical trials, uh, the ever changing patient burden. And, of course, decentralized clinical trials. So, without further ado, Steve Rosenberg. All right. Today, I uh, want to welcome Steve Rosenberg. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How are you? Not too shabby. It's been a long week, but I can't complain too much. Uh, where, uh, where are you at? I'm in uh, the Boston area. Nice. Been here for about 40 years. So, it's now home. It's getting cold up there? Not quite. Actually, it's been ridiculously warm for this time of year. But, you know, we'll take each day. As it could snow 10 feet tomorrow, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if you don't like the weather, just wait. Yep. Well, fair enough. I want to jump right in. Uh, kind of the way I do with all my guests is uh, I think it's always real interesting to kind of hear people's backgrounds. People come into the clinical trial space in all sorts of weird and interesting ways. So if you would, just kind of tell us a little bit about your origin story, if you will, for clinical trials. Yeah, thanks for that question. So I've been in the software business for greater than 40 years. I've done all kinds of software from database software, to expert system software, all kinds of application software, manufacturing, financial. And then I started doing healthcare in the mid 90s and that piqued my interest. And then in 2003, I joined a company called Phase Forward and that was in the clinical research EDC space, kind of a pioneer in that space. And it put its teeth into me. There was something about the clinical research space. First of all, it's hard from a software standpoint, and from a conducting clinical trials, it's hard, it's precise, it's regulated. The customers that I got to talk to were the smartest customers I've ever talked to in my career. Scientists, the mission of caring for the patient and doing unmet medical needs was upfront. And um, pharma is not the evil giant that a lot of people think. They're actually <laughs> out to, to better the state of the human condition. And so I got hooked on it and I stayed at Phase Forward through the Oracle acquisition. I left for a little bit and actually went over to PHT where I started you know, learning all about e-diaries and e-coa. 
went back to Oracle, got recruited back to Oracle and ran their health science business for six years. Actually retired in 2020 and then came out of retirement about a year and a half later to um, run Umotif. And that's where I am now and have been for the last 14 months. So you tried to get out and they just kept pulling you back in, it sounds like. it's. <laughs> I missed it. I missed it a lot. I, consulting for it wasn't the same as doing it. Sure. That's fair. And something, I mean, I don't know if you've experienced this, it's become kind of more apparent as I've been, you know, I've been on the site side my whole career, but do you find there's any sort of a dichotomy between user and customer in the software space and in clinical trials? I feel like, you know, oftentimes sites end up being, and patients obviously end up being the users of a lot of the software while the sponsors are, you know, the customer, I guess, so to speak, they're paying for it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's been a huge problem. So, you know, you're selling to pharma and so they're buying with their interests in mind and their interests are, I have a protocol, it's got a stat plan, I need to collect the data and everyone else I'm paying. So everyone else, just you're going to do it my way because I'm paying you and I have very little empathy or regard for what you have to go through to conduct this trial. Right. Fortunately, that's changing just like everything in pharma from an IT perspective slowly, but it is changing. And there is more concern for what sites go through and what patients go through to actually participate and be an eager participant in clinical trials. But you're right, that that problem, you know, you build software so the sites want to buy it. And then when they go deploy it, I mean, so the pharma wants to buy it. And when they go deploy it, the sites have trouble using it or, you know, all these weird things start to happen. But fortunately, um, that's changed a bit and technology has helped that. But, you know, attitudes are changing slowly but surely. Yeah, well, and I would think it would still be a of great value. I mean, if there's better adoption, if sites love your product, if patients love your product, I mean, isn't that good for you at the end of the day? Yes, um, and that's you know that's what I've been. So in the past, you know, before I retired, and currently what I'm doing, I've been a big advocate for the patient, and I always believe that you know if you have a highly engaged patient, that your everything else will flow successfully. Their data will be collected accurately. The sites won't have too much problems. People will show up and do what they need to do when they need to do it. And then everything will flow better. I personally think that the patient's been mistreated for several years. I I always like to say that up until maybe a few years ago, patients were called subjects. So are the mice. (laughs) And so, you know, I think that's changing slowly. And I don't think in society we've treated patients the way. I, I always tell the story, you know, we all travel a lot for this business. We go to an airport. The first people that join are the active military. Why not board clinical trial participants? Why not treat them like the heroes that they are? They're sacrificing time and money and, and, you know, time and their body. And it's a major commitment to be in a clinical trial. And they're trying to better the world. Some are doing it out of desperation, but even those people are paying it forward. But many do it because they think it's the right thing to do. And I think we should recognize them as, as what they are. And then that would flow into the great success of clinical trials, you know? Yeah, no, it's it's been to your point. I think overlooked. I mean, and it, you know, as someone who sees patients, I still see patients. I mean, it feels insane sometimes the things we ask of them, and knowing and telling them, "Hey, look, you're not getting any benefit from this, very likely." Right. And to to under to, to see that they're still willing to take half a day off of work to drive across town to find childcare to, you know, get a. $45 patient stipend. When you stand back and look at it, I mean, it is fairly ridiculous the way we've treated patients versus what we expect of them in terms of compliance with these protocols. It's, yeah, it boggles my mind. Yeah, no, it's, um, no, I think you're absolutely right. And the fact that you get to see the patient, what they go through to get to you is rather enlightening. I mean, I remember reading a protocol, I won't say what farm it's from, but it was for an asthma drug. And the inclusion criteria was, you have to have, have be an asthmatic. You have to smoke, and you have to commit to not quitting smoking for six months. <laughs> it's like I'm not sure that's good for the patient. Right. You know, I know what they were trying to accomplish with that study, but I'm not so sure that you really want to recruit into that trial. So it's the lack of empathy was, and again, I I want to emphasize. I think it's changing. The lack of empathy was astounding. Yeah. And to your point, I do think it's getting better, and the the sort of awareness is becoming a little more ubiquitous but even now we're doing gi trials where there are available drugs on the market but we're asking patients to participate in placebo controlled trials it, there's still a very fine line i guess between scientific rigor and what's best for the patient 
Um, yep. You know, I know there's this discussion about clinical research as a care option, and sometimes I think that can be, it can muddle things a little bit. Uh, but again, overall, I, I think I'm with you. I think we're slowly kind of moving in the right direction. Yeah, I was involved in that. <laughs> no one likes to say the acronym CRACO, but I was involved in that <laughs> in the early days of the clinical research as a care option. And, um, you know, there was all kinds of cases where there were better outcomes for diabetics. I think there was a, a site in South Carolina, I forget, the South Coast, I think it was called, that had better outcomes with their diabetics, even if they weren't on the drug. But it was primarily because they saw doctors more often and they got paid. And so the outcomes were both financial as well as health-wise, but, you know, it skews it a little bit. I don't think that that movement recognized the sacrifice that patients make. Yeah, I, I'm admittedly mixed. It depends on what day of the week you ask me as to whether or not I would uh, sort of consider <laughs> consider the CRACO acronym to be accurate or misleading even at times, depending right. on you know what the situation is. I think it's a really nuanced thing that sometimes gets overlooked just for better marketing, I guess. But uh, it's challenging, right? I mean, walking that line again between, I mean, what we're doing is essentially, we're doing science here, I guess, but <laughs> also not to making it overly burdensome for the patient. Again, I think that's a, that's still a line we're, we're trying to figure out, especially with the, the advent of decentralized trials and things moving further away with maybe a little bit of less, maybe less control. I mean, maybe not, but I think that's still sort of up for debate at this point. It is. It definitely is. And um, it's the central, we could talk about decentralized trials to the cow comes home. I, <laughs> I, for one, am exhausted by that acronym. I think it's a bad acronym. I think it had its moment. I think what it has done is allow for patient choice how they experience a trial. I was I was at a conference not that long ago, and I've also talked to someone, but a Pfizer person got up there and said that 51% of their visits are not in the clinic, and zero of their trials are completely decentralized. So they're now giving patient choice, saying, listen, you know, here's the things you have to do in a clinic, but there's a whole bunch of things you can do somewhere else. We could have someone come to your house. They actually have these giant trailers that they'll put on your street. You can come out and do some stuff. You know, you can go to the CVS. And and so it's I find that interesting. And I also think, you know, that it puts a big burden on the patient because now they have to decide how to experience a trial. And, you know, it may be easier to have someone come to your house, but maybe it's not. You know, you got to get right. dressed. You got to – certain things you have to do to your house. You know, I got to get the cleaning person come in or scrub <laughs> this. And so – it's unclear to me whether that is a huge advantage or not. But one thing I know is it puts a burden on the patient. Pfizer has invested an enormous amount of money in concierge services through an outsourcing firm because they can't call. So people calling the patients to help them decide and guide on how to do their next visits, not every pharma can afford to do that. you know. And so it's troublesome. I think technology can help. I think you, we could prepare patients for their next event through technology, whether it's in the clinic or not, I think you're starting to see more and more of that started to show up, but it's still not ubiquitous by any stretch of imagination. So, yeah, that that's fair, and I think it's something I struggled with, sort of the distinction between like more tech integration and then DCT. And I think I, I sort of confused those in a lot of ways in the beginning. But I feel like there's a lot of easy, I, I say easy, but I guess intuitive tech solutions we could be bringing to the table that could, again, help things tremendously to your point beyond just like saying a DCT, well, it's DCT, they can go, they can do it at home. And, right. you know, I didn't, I didn't always consider the things that you mentioned. I mean, yeah, you got to clean your house. You got to let some, you got a lot of stranger in your house. Uh, you may not want your neighbors to know that you're sick or have, you know, people you dropping walk, you by. You got to dog in the other room. You got to. Yeah, right. You know. It, it, yeah, you're, and you're sort of creating – now you're creating like the burden of, of choice for somebody who really have never been through this process before. They don't know, maybe don't even recognize what the, the benefits or downfalls may be to deciding how they decide. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting and, again, very, very nuanced. Right. And if you bring the site into that equation, the more technology you give a patient, the bigger the burden on the site. The site has to know how to – provision a patient, how to offer help, and the tech doesn't work. I can't get on the internet. My phone doesn't work this. I dropped my phone in the toilet. I mean, who knows? And now the site is the point of contact for the patients. I remember when I was uh, at PHT, it was still the days where there were investigator meetings. And we used to fly all around the world and teach the sites how to provision patients. That's not done anymore. 
No one's doing in-person meetings and bringing devices. So the sites get shipped this box of equipment and it's like, have fun. They have to hire IT people to help <laughs> sick patients figure out how to Bluetooth connect this. I mean, it's just the burden. You know, yeah, you can recruit different people and maybe get better diversity and hit some different geographies and maybe help that. But it's not it doesn't come for free it, all the way down. You're creating a different kind of burden on the ecosystem to conduct these trials. Yeah. I, again, I think it's been underappreciated how, I, you know, I've always considered sites and patients are kind of in the same bucket. I know they're obviously distinct from one another, but look, we <laughs> we love our patients and they we build relationships with them and them with us. We become attached in different ways and good ways. But again, if it's hard for them, it's hard for us. And if it's hard for us, that trickles down to them. Yep. To your point, you know, we get shipped these e-pros, e-diaries. Well, you know, we don't just get shipped one. We, I'm working with six different vendors who have, have shipped us e-diaries. They're all different from each other. None of them are the same. Some things are just not intuitive at all. And that does, that creates problems, not just for us, but then downstream to the patient. And it, yeah, it's, it becomes a real mess real quick. Yeah. I mean, you have to install clever shelving to keep things separate. Yeah. I mean, what <laughs> yeah. device to give to what? I mean, I got to imagine that sometimes you're pulling out the wrong device to get to someone that's in the wrong study. And I mean, of course that's going to happen. The, also, the other thing is the relationship that you establish with a patient is one of trust. And I don't believe that there's a relationship that pharma has that is as trusting as that relationship. People that, you know, and so, yeah, there is some trust. You trust pharma to produce good science and you trust pharma you know, to some extent that their their protocols are ethical. And of course, you're going to review them and all, all those things. But it's a different kind of trust. I mean, these patients that come to you to enroll in a clinical trial are really trusting you with their health and well-being. And that relationship becomes tighter than almost any relationship you can get in your life. Yeah. So, and then you're responsible for their safety. You know, yeah, pharma wants to know about it, but you're the one that's got to put eyeballs on them. And if they do televisits versus coming to your offices, that's another burden of, and you know, I don't even know how tall you are, right? So on video. And so, <laughs> How do you monitor someone's safety just by talking to them on video? It's a whole different level of burden and interaction, but I think that whole thing is built on trust. And I think that yeah. trust becomes super important, especially if you're not seeing them in person as often as you once did. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree. And that's why I do think that the the technology that's going to be the most successful is are the ones that help the relationship versus try to replace it in some way. Uh yep. You know, ultimately, I do think because again, it's I get that like some people will sign up, they'll talk to a guy in a call center somewhere and they don't care and they will. But I mean, that's just not that's the exception more than the rule, I think. Uh, and, you know, we've talked to patients who they are. They're like, oh, Pfizer. I'm not again, just an example, nothing against Pfizer, but I'm not doing anything. I'm not giving them any my data, you know, and then you, you have to develop that relationship with your patient and explain to them how clinical trials work. And that, again, it's, it requires that level of relationship building to, they have to want to come see you. They have to want to comply with the protocol. And yep. uh, again, many of them aren't going to do that just on, you know, on their, of their own accord necessarily. Yeah, and then there's, once that you get them to sign up and once you walk them through the consent and once you, get through all of that and they say, okay, I'm in. Then you have six months, nine months, whatever it is of that patient's participation. How do you keep them engaged? Yeah. How do you make sure that they're feeling that they're getting the benefit that's worth their time in the trial? And that benefit could come in in the form of they feel better. They know they're helping the greater good. I mean, whatever that benefit is to them, you know, they're getting a good cookie when they show, whatever that benefit is to them, they need to know it. And during that ongoing trial. You need an eager, engaged patient to be successful. And that's where I also think technology can help. I think you could actually, you know, nudge people along and give them good encouragement. And I'm not talking about gamification because this is not a game, but some positive reinforcement and some engaging thing, um, TikTok-like or something that helps the patient remain engaged with the study. And, and that's a challenge. You know, I, I promised you that I wasn't going to do any kind of sales calls on this, and I won't. But there are ePro vendors out there that are starting to address that. And I came out of retirement because um, the one that I joined is addressing that very problem. It's the engaged patient that we're after, not the compliant patient. And with engagement comes compliance. 
but compliance doesn't really mean engaged. It's, that's a great that's that's a great point that yeah I have not I've not considered it that way but you're a hundred percent right but I mean to that point I mean no please by all means you're welcome I, I want to hear more about you know you motif and, and what you guys are doing so f- please please feel yeah. free to elaborate a little bit more on 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 the company yeah so um, you motif is a company that's actually innovating in the in the patient you know the classic epro eco space but we're doing it started we started with the patient. The company was started 10 years ago by two guys who worked with two Parkinson's patients to help them record their health and well-being to be able to show with their caregiver. It wasn't started as a pharma services company by any stretch. But over time, they got noticed because what they built is a highly patented, user-friendly user interface that has recently been um, scientifically validated to be equivalent to a regular text questionnaire, which is a big thing. Uh, Willie Muhausen, shout out to Willie. (laughs) <laughs> um, we did, conducted that validation study independently and, and gleamed it equivalent. But Umotif has always started with the patient. Pharma starts with the protocol and says, what do you have to do to do? What do I need from the patients to do? We start with the patient and say, what does the patient need to be compliant with this study and engage all through their participation in the study? We measure engagement. We give nudges. We give information. We give videos. We really take the patient view of what makes them an eager and willing and actively compliant participant in a clinical trial. It's a very different way of thinking than the other vendors in the space. And it was enough to compel me to come out of retirement. Um, It was right in line with my passion for the patient and I saw something different. And so sometimes I wonder why I came out of retirement because I'm not not that young, but when I think about it and talk about it, my passion for the patient and their ability to get the benefit of clinical trials that they deserve is really being you know, at least partially, if not really well met by you motif at this moment. And that's enough of a sales call. But anyone who we answer, check it out. Check it out. So, no, no, that's okay. So you guys don't just put an alarm on their phone that's impossible to turn off? <laughs> no, but we could. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, you know, to that, I mean, to that end, I'm a, I mean, you guys, uh, are you seeing or I guess utilizing more of like bring your own device or still provisioning for the most part. I find it really interesting that, I mean, we do a lot of trials that have knee diary component, but almost none of them have bring your own device. And I hear it talked about more. Is there a reason for that? Is it just not reliable or is there an issue with privacy or security or why are we not seeing that? So that's a multifaceted question. So I'll answer all of it in one little thing. So um, UMOT started as a BYOD company because it was all just use your phone to record this stuff. And also then the next phase was late phase, and that was also all BYOD. So we live as a single app, um, either in the iOS app store or in the Google store. And it's a single app. And then when you register for your study, you get the payload you need to conduct the study. We see a lot of BYOD in the late phase, a ton mm-hmm. of it. Almost all of it is in is BYOD late phase. In the clinical world, you're still seeing a lot of provisioning, but now you're starting to see a mix. I think there's a couple of reasons, and oddly enough, the patient drives some of this. When you enroll in a clinical trial, very often the patient likes to see, okay, this is my life, this is my phone, and this is my clinical trial device. And it could be the same kind of phone. It could be a nice Android device, just like the one they have, but this is the one they pick up when they want to be a clinical trial participant. It's not as integrated with their daily life. And it's just like, you know, people that have two phones, my work phone, my personal phone, I let those worlds meet. So you right. get some of that from the patient. You also get pharma being nervous about the phone, but the software, the technology has come to the point, not all companies necessarily comply with it, but the technology is now can be self-aware of what device it's on and adjust the form factor to be compliant with that device mm. in terms of size of text, number of questions on the screen all those kinds of things. Sometimes it's a tablet. So you could get rid of the, oh, I'm worried about screen size and I'm worried about that. Those go away. Like a like a responsive website. Yeah. Some people worry about the operating system getting upgraded. If you're an app, you tend to be, you've built built the app to be protective of that. You know, um, sometimes there's an upgrade that you have to do something to that, but rarely if you built it right. And so, a lot of these companies aren't apps. A lot of these companies are, uh, you know, you download this thing for this specific trial. They're going to get in more trouble when operating systems upgrade and things like that. Hmm. So there's things you can do. I think BYOD should be available to anybody who wants to use their own phone. And you should only provision when the patient 
wants to. I think farmers should get out of the business of dictating that, but it's going to take time. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. I just again, I, I've I'm sort of surprised by how limited I've seen the BYOD option. We're seeing it a little bit here and there, but you know, for studies that have long e diary periods, where a 30 day screening and then a 12 or 16 week double blind phase, and they're using it every day, I mean, that's a little crazy. You got an extra phone you're carrying around that whole time. A lot of people. To your point, some do want to keep it separate, but a lot of them don't want to have an extra phone laying around somewhere right, that right. they have you're to right. keep up with. They got to charge it. Oftentimes we're getting like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got an old Android phone from like 2013 or maybe it was 2015 that, you know, it's just, they're not super reliable. They don't stay charged very long, uh, but yeah. we, we don't have any other option to give them, you know? Yeah. No, pharma, a lot of pharma is still nervous because, you know, you're spending what? Sixty million dollars to to fund a study all in between the site, and they're sitting there going, "What's another million bucks in provisioning costs?" So they they just try to de-risk it. But again, right. as we talked about much earlier in this, the lack of empathy for the sites and the patients drives that behavior. Versus, what would be better for the patient and the site? Maybe I should offer them their choice to do a BYOD or a provision device. When we provision device, you still have to download the app. It's not. <laughs> They don't come fully locked in conversion like the old days. When I was a PhD, we'd lock those phones up. You couldn't do anything on that phone but our stuff. When we provision, we don't do that. We, you know, download the app. Have right, a good day. Right. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I wonder if there's anything to the idea that you know, I wonder if you have more compliance with BYOD for the patients who want it. I mean, does that maybe does that save money that would have otherwise gone towards provisioning? I mean, I, I don't know. It does feel like everything is always a financial cost benefit analysis versus you know right. what might actually work best for for the execution of the trial and i i understand that to your point they're throwing a ton of money they don't i guess they want to try to control everything as much as they can but it almost feels like it's like backfires in, in some instances yeah that would be really interesting statistic if someone had it was would be to compare compliance with byod versus provision devices I don't really know what would happen. I, I mean, I know at PhD, everything was provisioned back then. This is going back into 2013. But, and when the devices failed, they could send them to us and we, you know, get the data off of it and then send it back. You can't do that with their own phone. But again, True. as I said, 10 years is a long time. The tech has changed to the point where it's not nearly as risky as it once could have been. And I'd love to know those stats. That's a, I'm going to try to figure out if anybody's done that. You should do that study. <laughs> all right well you get somebody from pharma to pay me I'll, I'll consider it but yeah i mean we what we see often is that we have a lot of people in rural areas they take a phone that's on some kind of cellular network that isn't available or isn't reliable their phone is their phone works but they have to drive into town to get it to submit or transmit the the data back to us so there's sometimes we're waiting uh for their you know you know, these are farmers. Maybe they have a weekly trip into town or every three days they go into town. And we have to wait for them to transmit their data so that we can we can receive it. I mean, that that's wild in this day and age. Yeah, it is. And that's a really good point because out in the farms, they probably got one carrier that works. Right. And probably no, maybe no Wi-Fi worth mentioning. So, no, it's um, it's complicated. Well, that's it right there. It is, right? I mean, I, I'm certainly guilty of oversimplifying you know uh, at times but when you <laughs> the more you dig down you're like well there's actually a lot there's a lot to this it's way more complicated than it's often made out to be <laughs> yeah there's that's the other, other thing you know clinical trials have more moving parts than anyone wants to really understand and until you've been involved in it everything from the drug logistics to i mean it's there's so many moving parts i was talking to a ceo of a cro i won't mention who it is but he was telling me and this was just at the CNS summit a few weeks ago. He was telling me that the supply chain and the reliability of delivery of FedEx is failing. And mm -hmm. he has seen pharma hire their own private planes to deliver drugs to sites to make sure they show up on time. And so you know, the world economy, there's so much headwinds in the logistics these days that I never even thought about that possibility. I mean, for me, if I order something from Amazon and it's a day late, I don't care. <laughs> you, got right. a, you got a drug with a half-life of four days, you're going to care a lot. So, you know, it's it's a whole different world out there. And the and the amount of moving parts is astounding. And that's the other reason that I'm attracted to it because, like I said, it's hard. It's just hard. Right. Well, I mean, to your point, too, I mean, that I'm 
like you, I think that's what keeps me sort of so engaged with it though, too, right? Is that there's, it's a lot of problem solving and there's a lot of, uh, sort of investigation and root cause analysis and figuring all this stuff out is, is part of the fun. I mean, frankly, you know, we're, we're trying to make it better for everyone. Uh, it's yeah. not, it's not good if drugs are not accessible or ridiculously overpriced where no one can afford them because we're just doing a bad job of getting them to market, you know? It's true. It's absolutely true. But even at the site level, you know, we don't often think about that. I'm saying, you know, where's the drug? I have a patient coming in today. I don't know how it got here. What, all the things that took place for it to, to come. So it's, yeah, it's uh, extremely complicated. <laughs> yeah, it's extremely complicated. But, you know, at the end of the day, the one thing that hasn't changed is we're performing experiments on human beings. And, you know, and I think people, you know, you hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, we just get the data from the EHRs. Oh, we just do this. Oh, we'll just, and I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, don't lose sight of the fact that you're performing experiments on humans. These EHR systems are set up for building and scheduling. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Let's try to stay as precise as possible when we're talking about testing drugs on 300 people and then releasing it to a population of 20 million people. You well, know, let's, yeah. Let's have rigor. <laughs> well, and that, that's what gets me. And, you know, I'm going to go try not to go on too much of a tangent here. A, oh, to your I point. To your point, you know, we work with a lot of different physicians, different practices, different EHRs, you know, I mean, the EHR data is shockingly inaccurate. If you talk to a patient and they're like, well, no, I'm not on that drug. I've never been on that drug. I'm actually on this drug or this diagnosis is not correct. I've had this, but not this. It's, it, it really becomes really enlightening when you go through these with patients hundreds and thousands of times. And then, yeah, it's, I hate that we're sort of relying on that too much possibly, but then to your point, I feel like we're (laughs) so exclusive with how we test these medications, but then when it is set free into the world, it's being used on all kinds of people that weren't part of your small subset that went through a clinical trial. You know, that boggles my mind and I find it frustrating because, you know, if I'm in a migraine clinic And I can't enroll a migraine patient in a trial. That seems like a problem to me. They don't match (laughs) the, this is what the patient population looks like, but we're not testing it on that patient population. We're testing it on the, the perfect patient that barely exists in, in the real world. Right. Right. That can't be good. That can't be good science. No, it can't be. I mean, that's a really great point. Migraines is an excellent point because there's so many drugs and a lot of these trials are looking for someone who's never taken Imitrex or has never done it. <laughs> right. And then, but when it gets prescribed, it's going to be prescribed for people who are taking Imitrex. And it's going to be prescribed for, and so I guess it's watching carefully what happens in the real world once it's out there or, you know, taking way more time to test it on all these different permutations and combinations. There's some balancing act. And I think the FDA does a great job trying to figure that out. But you know, they only got what they got to figure that out with. They only get to see what they see. And so it's... Yeah. No, and, and look, I don't envy people who have to write these protocols and, and try to control <laughs> so rigorously for, for all the different things. I mean, I get that that's a challenge. But I think for me, it sort of boots on the ground. Again, I see, oh, well, we'll use DCT to reach all these patients. And I'm like, well, the patients are here. We're just not... We're not, we're not picking the right patients. We're not... The criteria is so stringent that... You know, people want to participate. They want to do something, you know, for the greater good. A lot of people are even willing to go through all the burden we place upon them, but we turn them away every day. Well, sorry, your BMI is over 30. Well, I live in Oklahoma. You know how many people have a BMI over 30? I mean, a lot of them, most, (laughs) maybe most of them, (laughs) but when the drug's approved, do you think they're not going to give it to people with a BMI over 30? Heck no. They're going to give it to them just the same they would someone else. That's such an interesting, that's such an interesting point. You know, I've known protocols that when they come out and they go into ops, that they look at the inclusion criteria and the ops people go, well, there's nobody on the planet that could possibly participate in this trial. And there's a lot of iterations between ops and, and the stats and science and docs to go back and forth, try to come with a protocol that you could actually recruit somebody into. But maybe it needs to even be done differently. Maybe they need to, rather than go between ops and that, start to go into sites like yours and like look at the patient population and have conversations rather than, you know, now they extract EHR data and say, oh, look, there's 22 patients in Oklahoma that, you know, could be part of this trial. But 
who knows? They're not talking to people to actually talk to the patients. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's always been always been a problem, yeah. Yeah. I always say that it's one thing finding people that may have the criteria. It's another thing finding people that are willing. And how do you how do you measure willingness? Yeah, that that and again, a very underrated point. I mean, we're seeing, you know, not just the EHR to EDC and stuff like that, but yeah, all these like AI unstructured data searches that, you know, you can you can pull a lot of interesting data, but that's only a small part of it. Again, they have to want to do it. They have to be even be willing to be talked to about it. You know, if you start cold calling all these people, how many are saying, wait, how'd you get my information? What do you, what are you, who are you with? What are you doing? <laughs> right. Right. It's yeah. got to be that trusted relationship between doctor patient. That's to me, that's the point of, of contact that needs to be leveraged for clinical trial enrollment. I mean, if my doctor told me, you know, I'm on a stat and my doctor said, you know, this statin's not doing what it should do for you anymore. Here's a clinical trial. Try this stat. And I think it's a good thing for you. I'd probably consider it. But if, you know, Pfizer called me up and said, hey, you know, we got a better Lipitor. I'm like, you know, you want to be in a trial? I'm like, uh, call my, let me talk to my doctor. I mean, I'm always going to go to my doctor for that trust because he knows me as opposed to Pfizer that's seen 19 data points on me as making a decision. So. Yeah. And, and again, that's been my whole mixed feelings again on DCT is, is if you take out the physician relationship, how much success are we going to see? And again, maybe this is like a, I'm like you, I'm sort of sick of talking about it, but I also can't help talking about it at the same time. Right, right. Like, exactly. you know, may, may, maybe it's just a small subset of trials that this will make sense for, but you know, a majority of your phase two, phase three trials are going to really be, you know, a hybrid or fairly traditional in terms of, of how they operate. I mean, I just can't see it. You know, we do surgical trials. I mean, there's no way you're going to just pull patients in <laughs> to go through surgeries from, you know, a random phone call. It's just not, I just can't possibly see that happening. Yeah. And I, you know, that's that whole DCT thing is I just don't think there's going to be uh, late phase studies that are completely virtual and we're, we're doing some at UMOT. Of course. But yeah. There are interventional trials. I just, I just don't see it. I just don't see, I could see, like I said, some of the stuff happening at home or some of the stuff happening in a nearby clinic and not having, or nearby CVS or something, but to never come in and see a doctor face to face, to never get eyeballs on that person. And, you know, I, I was talking to, this is, it goes back a few years. I was talking to someone at Vertex and they were trying to do more trials in the home. So they were taking, you know, they're all cystic fibrosis and they were taking adult patients and saying, can we come to your home and conduct this? And they would pretty much move into the house for a day. They'd set up their centrifuges. They would pretty much bring the lab to the house. And to me, that was clever, but it wasn't a virtual visit. It was, it was, really trained, qualified people coming in and conducting the visit in their house. That's moving the clinic to the person's house. That made more sense to me. They're sure. willing to make that expense and, you know, pack it up and drive to rural Alabama, you know, go for it. Right. But that's a whole lot different than, oh, can you get on a Zoom call and tell me, and hold the stethoscope to your chest so I can... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I no, I'm with you. That makes sense. And that's got to be I mean, I just can't see that scaling. Uh, you know, going to every patient's house for every visit. I mean, maybe maybe they're it's worth it, you know, financially for the sponsor to do it. I mean, I was having this conversation with someone today that you know, we all we love to talk about patient centricity. You know, obviously, it's, you know, it's great, but I, I just have a hard time thinking that sponsors are going to throw away more money and overly complicate things just because patients want it. If it doesn't make sense financially, I can't imagine them doing some of these things. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm cynical, but. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. But the, the those economic lines draw in the rare disease space, right? Like adult right, right. Disease, right. When the drug is costing, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a month. I have a friend who's on a pill that's $500 a pill one every day. And so, and it's a rare disease. So once you're in that land, it does make sense because yeah, those right. patients are almost impossible to find. And if, you know, no, yeah, that was someone had, had made that comment. Like, look, if you're in a healthy patient's trial, they're probably not good. You're going to come to the site. You're going to do whatever's asked because you're replaceable. You know, now right. if you're a rare disease and you need to fly to Bora Bora to get a blood draw, fine. Well, they'll do it, whatever it takes to get <laughs> well, whatever it takes. So yeah, no, that's an interesting and important distinction probably to make. And uh, but it's still an economic decision. It's still an economic decision they're making, right? It's still true. You know, they still got a spreadsheet to plug in the numbers. 
Um, I was talking to, um, I was at a pre galleon conference a bunch of years ago, and I was talking to a guy, forget the disease, but it was, they won the award, and it was a disease that killed two-year-olds. You know, by the time you were two, you were pretty much dead. And he knew every, so the, the drug was under um, development and clinical trials for a number of years. He knew every family and every patient that participated in every trial. Right. There's so few of them and, and everywhere in the world. I mean, he knew them by name. He knew what happened to their child. I mean, he was very emotional talking about it. It's like, sure. you know, it was crazy. But that level of rare disease, I'm sure they would have flown anywhere and done anything. Yeah. To get what they needed to do. So. Yeah. Now, it'll be really interesting to see how this all sort of or plays out over the next next few years. And uh, yeah. do you think it's you know, really going to play out or do you think it's just going to continue in this slow, evolving I used to always tell people, listen, they go, do you think this is going to happen? Do you think this is going to happen? I'd say, listen, everything's going to happen. You're <laughs> going to have pockets, depending on the patient population, the disease, the patient demographics. It's all going to happen. Fair. Right? You know, you're not going to give a diary to an Alzheimer's patient. You're not going right. to. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that, and, the, you know, what if you stratify it fine enough, you'll find something. It's all going to happen. The question is, until... You know, I was at these go to these conferences now. It's the only time you could see people in real life, and <laughs> and you know, people are talking about well, if we could standardize the protocols. I'm like, no, <laughs> we can't. So let's move on. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's all going to be different, and and as the science gets more complicated, the protocols are going to get more populated. The populations per study is going to go down. The rigor of the collection. You're starting to see these crazy whether they call them basket trials or umbrella trials, with so many different arms in the same study. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's oncology studies out there with 10 arms. Yeah. And you're like, and the reason they do it is they could go have people go from one arm to the other and they don't have to. I mean, it's crazy how complicated it's getting. So, yeah, I know we're, we're seeing some of those. We're relatively new in the oncology space, but I started getting in some of these protocols. I'm like, wait, what? Why are there seven cohorts? Yeah. Uh, and it's. <laughs> It's so yeah, it's, hard. it's ridiculously complex. Well, and we're even being awarded studies that we're very transparent in that we really have extremely few potential patients. I think just again, they're there's desperate for, for anyone, anyone who may possibly qualify for their study, they're willing to throw that study opportunity out to to a site. So yeah, it's 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 wild. I mean, I guess to my point, though, I mean, look, how many companies are popping up or have popped up over the last couple of years? They got a crap load of money. They're talking that they're claiming to be DCT. I mean, I feel like bottom's going to fall out at some point. You know, we're going to see some sort of consolidation or just a bunch of companies go away, don't you think, over the next, you know, probably year, yeah. given, especially given the economic <laughs> situation? Hey, the, the software companies like the Science 37s and medicals and sure. stuff. Yep. Yeah, I think they're going to even have to pivot into something more realistic or they're going to, as, as long as they hold on to bring us your decentralized trials, they're going to have a problem doing it. They're definitely going to have a problem doing it because they've scaled beyond the available business to them. You know, there's a conference, the DCTRA group, I went to their recent conference and they've even backed off. They're now deciding decentralized trials, any trial that has a visit that's not in the clinic. Right, right. And I'm much more comfortable with that definition. I'd like to, to change the acronym to be like patient choice. But if if you, if that's the way of the world, it opens up a whole different need rather than you know, e consent, televideo, and e pro are the three for the. That's the decentralized trial, and it just is a different problem to solve once you have this mix. And by the way, the burden, as we talked about earlier, it falls on the site. It falls yeah. on the site to manage these patients as they are out in the real world doing whatever they want to do their visits. You know, you never know. So. Yeah, no. And it, again, it's, it's not lost on me that, I mean, what you're asking from PIs starts to get real nebulous, right? Because I don't know, well, I'm not a PI, but the PI doesn't know who this random home health nurse may be. They can't really, they can't even really confidently delegate them without some, <laughs> knowledge of their capabilities. I mean, it starts to raise yeah. just so many questions, not, I mean, just burden aside, like responsibility, right? Like yeah. who's yeah. going to put their name on the line? Later? How exactly. do you know they're qualified to conduct the test they're going into the house they do? Oh yeah. You know? Well, and yeah. at some point I think you're going to have, look, somebody's going to 
there's going to be some kind of issue with someone coming into somebody's house. I mean, that starts, who's responsible for that? The PI? I mean, the PI technically still has oversight of what's happening in the trial. So if a nurse goes in and I don't know, blows their arm up with bad phlebotomy or, uh, I don't know, <laughs> steals something from their house, God forbid, you know, who knows what kind of right. weird stuff can happen right. out there. <laughs> Or trips and falls on the sidewalk. I mean, there you go. Knows, exactly. Right? Exactly. Again, more moving parts than you can manage. Right. So. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a, look, it's a fascinating time to be, like, I can't blame you for wanting to come out of retirement and be involved with, with what's going on, especially given the, the momentum and just the excitement with all this, I guess, enthusiasm, you know, maybe it's a good word for, yeah. for everything moving uh, towards more patient focus. So, you know, again, really, really fascinating times. Well, I love it. Where can, uh, where can people find you online, Steve? Um, so, so, um, I'm, I'm available almost everywhere online. So I'm obviously at umotif.com, www.umotif.com. You can find me there. We didn't talk about this at all, but my wife and I have started a nonprofit. It's very active in the Boston community, working with other nonprofits. It's called the one by one project. So spelled out.org. You can find me there. And, um, that's a whole different part of my life that, this isn't what this is for. Sure. And then if you just Google me and, you know, Steve Rosenberg is a common name. I obviously run a dive shop in Tortola and I've been a cancer doctor for many presidents. That's not me. <laughs> but, but if you put Oracle or clinical research, you'll find some of the stuff that I've done all over. Um, I'm still out there under Oracle periodically. So I'm nice. easy to find and uh, look forward to talking to you in the further or the future. So. Sure. Yeah, I'll make sure uh, post your, your contact info on, in our show notes. Make sure I'll, I'll link up to your to your nonprofit. That might be uh, maybe something interesting to follow up on in the future. Be interested in hearing yeah. some more about that. And uh, I really want to thank you for coming on. Anything else you want to want to say before we before we sign off here? I can't really. I can't believe how fast the time went. I thought this was <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> I could have this conversation forever. But um, your perspective on sites is really interesting. So <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm, I'm considering making this like even more just like long form and just letting it go because I'm to your point. I mean, there's so much depth to some of these, these topics. And I feel like it's, it's a shame sometimes to try to make it short and digestible when there's just all kinds yeah. of cool kind of rabbit holes to go down. Right. Yeah. The interesting thing is what's the attention span of a typical listener who's going to listen for over 45 minutes. Yeah. Fair. That's a fair right. point. Right. And, you know, <laughs> so, but I, you know, this could wet the whistle and get people interested to do more research. So. That's it. That's it right there. Well, again, Steve Rosenberg, I, I appreciate you coming on, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. As always, thank you so much for listening to Note to File Podcast. Make sure to check us out at notetofilepodcast.com for episode transcripts, show notes, as well as our guests' contact information. Thanks again.